I remember Firefly, and I'm pretty sure that if you're watching this channel, you remember Firefly. And I think that some of the things that we remember are probably very similar. I remember a lot of It's Shiny, Captain. And I remember a lot of God Rams. And I remember It's a Brown Coat thing you wouldn't understand. And I remember Might and Peck as measurements of size. And that is what I want to talk about today. How to make in-world expressions that make sense and make your world feel richer and more like a fantasy experience. Welcome. My name is Marie Mullaney and this is another episode of Just In Time Worlds. I do have a Discord server if you would like to join in the conversation. The link to that is down below in the video description. And if you want to help me keep making these videos, the link to my book is also in the description and in the comments down below. It is currently in its pre-release sale format and will be on Kindle Unlimited on 10 September. Okay, enough self-plugging. Let's crack on with expressions in a fantasy world. The first type of in-world expression that I would like to discuss is idioms. Now, idioms are a great use of in-world expressions. But you have to be a little careful here because the temptation exists to use our world idioms as is. A good example of this is the expression a bridge too far. But a bridge too far is an expression that comes from the Second World War when there was one of the American generals that advanced literally a bridge too far resulting in a near catastrophic resolution to the battle. If you're going to use that as an idiom, where does it come from in your world? Another good example is the expression he was caught red-handed, meaning he was caught as a thief. That comes from Scotland and the implication is that the thief was caught with his hands full of blood from having poached on the Lord's hunting preserve. Now that one is very usable in any given fantasy world because the context from which it arises makes a lot of sense. That being said, it is still a good idea to kind of twist these idioms to something that you want it to mean. So maybe instead of he was caught red-handed, say something like he was caught with his dagger dripping, depending on the implications that you want to run with in that particular idiom. From fantasy... Some of our great idioms come from George R. R. Martin. The one that sticks with me always is dark wings, dark words, which is what he used when he referred to his ravens bringing news. Now, the reason why this was so evocative is because, one, it's a very duh statement, which an idiom should be. Dark wings, dark words. Obviously, ravens do have dark wings, and the words that they carry are written in dark ink. But the deeper meaning behind it is that a message sent by Raven automatically has associated urgency. And like we have the expressions, good news can wait, that's what this idiom is aimed at saying. It's always bad news because bad news is what can't wait. Which leads us to how do you create this kind of idiom? What you need to do is you need to take the central message that you want to communicate and then think about what imagery in your world is associated with that message. So I'll give you an example from my world. I wanted an idiom to say that big things are the result of small things. Big disasters come from small disasters. I wanted this to have originated in the northern duchy of my world, in the duchy of La Roche. This is a duchy that's above the Arctic line, so it's a lot of snow. This led me to the idiom, every snowflake in the avalanche protests its innocence. I have subsequently found that there is a Polish poet who said a similar kind of idiom before me. His specific quote is, no snowflake in the avalanche ever feels responsible. And that is the Polish poet Stanislaw. 
I must have actually read that somewhere for it to have inspired me to give this particular idiom in my world. But again, using our own world statements is okay as long as you put your own flavor and feel onto them to fit the environment of your world. Idioms is one of our in-world expressions. But what about quotes from in-world books? A book inside a book can really add a lot of depth to a world. One of the great examples in fantasy is from Catherine Kerr. She uses quotes on the top of chapters from these in-world books in her books. What I found really interesting about her implementation of this form of world building is that each book that she writes will normally only have one in-world book associated with it. So the first set of books have quotes from the secret book of Cadwalon the Druid. The second set of books have quotes from the Pseudo Umbilicus scroll, which in flavor feels like a different book, making it really amazing world building. And that leads me to the best advice I can give you when you're creating an in-world book. Do not get caught up in the weeds of actually writing the book. Make a very short summary of the kind of content that is found in the book and then define the style that the book is written in. Is it a formal storytelling style? Is it a philosophical style? Is it a religious homily style? Is it like a history textbook? Whatever the style is, every time that you create a quote from that book, make sure it's in the appropriate style. For an illustrative example of this, I'm going to turn to my own book, The Hidden Blade, which is currently on pre-order, link in the description and the comments. I also use in-world text to start each chapter, providing additional world-building elements, but I draw on several different in-world sources. So, compare these two quotes and I hope you'll be able to see what I mean about defining the style of the in-world source. First, a formal teaching style from the heraldic lore of the Bardic Guild. The consang way held that to inherit an office, man or woman, the candidate had to prove their worth by demonstrating their abilities as a hobbyer. To this day, a noble child who cannot learn hobby is judged unworthy of their sash and may not hold noble office. Oft times, such children turn to the guilds to forge new lives away from the courts of power. Okay, then a storytelling style from the tale of the beginnings. Hearken now and hear my tale. So it was that the consang ship sailed north from unknown southern lands across the Framet Sea and their ships made landfall wherever town stands today. At this time, every tribe was led by a troll carl and a rechtspreker. Each tribe stood alone. The troll carls of the tribes were powerful sorcerers, but the consang landed with 15,000 men and fully half knew the strange skills of Habi. In the battles of magic to come, those numbers came to matter more than the power of the troll carl, who numbered far fewer in their dark ranks. Do you see what I mean by stylistic differences in the in-world sources? The story has evocative language with imagery that a storyteller can use. The lore has dry information only. At least, that's what I hope to communicate. Let me know in the comments if I succeeded. Another area to pay attention to is how people speak in their everyday lives. I really enjoyed Michael Sullivan's work, but every time one of his characters said, come again, I was jerked right out of the narrative. Conversely, when one of Brandon Sanderson's characters said, he's trying to lead us to a bad alloy, I felt that this bit of slang was completely in keeping with the world and it took me deeper into the narrative. This is because magic in this world requires metal alloys to be burnt as power sources, 
So the expression was very evocative of the way that mages would think in this world. The same applies to my feeling about time. I've done a whole video on inventing a system to keep time in a world, which I'll add as a video card. So all I'll say here is that please, before you use a phrase like seconds later, consider if people in world have ever considered what a second is. Before you make an appointment for quarter past ten, consider if they have timekeeping that is precise enough to allow for the tracking of quarter hours. Pay attention to how people speak in world. It can help immerse your readers or it can throw them right out of the narrative. Okay, so we have covered everyday expressions, we've spoken about quotes, we've spoken about idioms. Let's talk about curse words. I have a bugbear here. I can curse like a sailor. Honestly, I have no problem with curse words. But I hate, I absolutely hate reading the F-bomb in fantasy novels. I hate reading expressions like damn in fantasy novels. And the reason why is because the moment I read it, I'm like, how did this word end up there? Do, do they also have a religion where you damned to hell? And that's why we have this expression. Bloody. Bloody is a derivative from blood of Christ. That's why it's a swear word. So how did that end up in your fantasy world as a curse word? Exactly. Curse words need to be pertinent to the culture that they're in. Good examples from fantasy authors, Brandon Sanderson's By the Mist explanation from Harry Potter, Son of a Bludger. And if you're using your religion, Jacqueline Carey uses Eloah's... I don't think I can say that on YouTube. Anyway, a lot of exclamations around her God's names and various pieces of their anatomy. You can build your curse words around your culture and use those. And people will pick up what they mean. Like in my world, I use the wheel as the primary religious iconography because it is a religion based on reincarnation. So my curse words tend to be things like broken spokes, the empty hub, by the wheel's brass rim, trodden, as in I feel trodden by the wheel. I am damned. I am trodden. I came up with quite a few derivatives around the wheel, which I sprinkle liberally throughout the books because the characters swear. They express anger, disgust, and fear, which is what we use curse words for. But they do it in a way that keeps the reader invested in the book rather than sending the reader off into our world's curse words and swear words and so forth. Please, when you're designing your world, come up with some swear words that your character uses that are not derivative of our swear words. In-world expressions allow you to show your world to readers or players in a way that is evocative to us as humans. It makes sense to us. And then when we're thinking of that world, we think of those expressions. The way that when we think of Firefly, its shiny captain is certainly a top of mind expression. Or when you think of George RRM and you think of, and now his watch is ended. Or when you think of my world, I hope that you will think of all the curse words that I came up with. This has been another episode of Just In Time Worlds. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. My name is Marie Mullaney. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds.